David is an honorary research fellow at the University of Roehampton having previously worked for 25 years for UCL Field Archaeology Unit. He then switched to the University of Suffolk, where he was, Sussex, sorry, I said Suffolk, Suffolk on the brain. You'll find out why in a second, where he was senior lecturer in archaeology um, in continuing education. His research interests include Roman period rural settlement and land use, religion and ritual in Roman Britain, and ancient and medieval coinage. And apart from that, he probably knows more than anybody else about Ivan Margery. Um, I do need to make a big thank you at this point to Hoxton History Group, who are in Suffolk. That's why I had Suffolk on the brain. Um, their donation actually allowed us to purchase the uh, Zoom subscription, which has enabled this to happen. So it wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for them. So thank you, Hoxton History Group. Okay. Without any further ado, I'm going to hand you over to David. If David, can share screen. If, David if you can share your screen now. Hopefully you can all see the full screen. Is that right? Uh, yes, I can hear. And that's the last you will hear from me. OK, so. Um, Thank you everyone for um, attending uh, this evening. Um, what I'm going to do is talk to you about uh, Ivan Donald uh, Margery, who was uh, famous, most uh, famous, I suppose, in terms of Roman road um, scholarship. But um, as you'll see, he was involved in so many different aspects of British archeology span and other aspects of um, everyday life as well. And he's very much a, a hero um, character of, of mine and others. Um, and we just wish that there were people like him, um, maybe there are, um, in, the, in the community today. But he was an incredibly generous man. And um, you'll see the benefits that we today um, still have from his uh, generosity. Um, so I'm going to start by quickly running through um, his life history and then illustrating um, aspects of those, um, those things and particularly looking at uh, Roman roads. And the first thing to um, point out is that um, his friends actually referred to him as Donald Margaret. Um, most of us today actually refer to him as Ivan Margaret. But if you look at the letters that he sends to his friends and people that he knew well, he actually signs them Donald Margery. Um, moving on to the next slide, and um, for some reason, the um, right, yes, that's fine. The, this, this talk was originally given five years ago um, when the Roman Road Research Group. Um, held uh, two conferences, one in Portsmouth and one in York, um, about Roman roads. And I was approached by um, Mike and, and some of the others to uh, um, talk about Margaret. Um, I think they've tried various other people um, to see who might, might be able to talk about him, and, and no one really knew anything about him. It was rather, rather sad that... Uh, um, someone who had contributed so much um, didn't seem to be um, well known in terms of their, 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 their personal history. So I put together uh, a PowerPoint which was given at um, these conferences and it's largely the same that you're seeing today with a few, um, a few additions. So starting with his own um, history. He was born in London into a military family. His grandfather and father um, have both been in the Royal Sussex Militia. Um, his mother, however, uh, was the daughter of Donald uh, Larnark, uh, who was a financier and banker, and that's where the wealth starts to come in. Um, so, that, that that particular family line was um, the source of his really quite considerable wealth. And in 1900, they moved um, from London to 
Charton Park in um, East Grinstead, which is sort of on the Surrey um, Sussex um, um, border. And that became their family home um, for about 40, 40 years. Um, he went up to Exeter College um, to study chemistry. His initial interests weren't particularly in terms of Romans or um, history. He was uh, interested in a wide range of um, scientific things, particularly looking uh, at evidence about the weather, and he was, uh, that was something that he, he studied throughout his life. And in 1913, the same year that he went to Oxford, he was elected at the age of 17 or 18 as a fellow of the Royal Meteorological Society. Um, Meteorological Society. 1916, um, his studies at Oxford were interrupted by the war when he was um, um, called up and went as a lieutenant in the Royal Sussex Regiment to France. Um, as we will see, it was quite an important time, his military service in terms of his Roman road studies later on. But sadly, he got badly injured in 1917 and came back to Britain. He'd been shot in the back, and he returned to France five days after the armistice and then had to spend a further um, six months or so um, in, in France um, after the, the war had ended. And it wasn't until 1919 um, that he returned to Oxford and spent the next couple of years there finishing his um, studies. He then returned to Sussex, where he was, of course, uh, um, in a, a, a well-off family situation. He was a gentleman um, farmer. And in um, 1927, he inherited from his uncle, his mother's brother, um, a substantial amount of money, a hundred, over £100,000. Difficult to estimate how much that was worth in modern money plus U Lodge, which was the property that he lived in um, and, until his death. 1927, he was elected a Fellow of the Royal Geographical Society and also joined both the Sussex and Surrey Archaeological Societies. Both of those were very important archaeological societies. Um, he also joined the Kent Archaeological Society, which was the other one in the southeast. Um, 1930, um, he really the first of his major gifts to um, various um, organisations. He gave 15.5 acres of which cross to the National Trust. Sorry if you can hear some scratching. It's my dog not making a noise. I will just interrupt for a second. Can you please keep them under control? Sorry about that. Um, so um, he, he gave this land, which was uh, very uh, near near to to where where he lived, and um, that's still held by the um, National Trust. So in 1927, then, joining the Sussex and Surrey Archaeological Societies for most of the remainder of his life, he wasn't just a passive member of these societies. He actually joined the council of both of them. He became chairman and he became vice president and president. Um, he took a, a really um, major role in, in, in both societies and they both financially benefited from it. Um, I'm less clear about his role in Kent, but he, he was a member and they received on his death um, quite large legacy, uh, le large legacy as well. 1932, he married uh, Dorothy Jolly and moved into U Lodge. Um, he'd previously stayed with his parents in the, um, the main family home. Um, and in this year, he was elected a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries. 1939, um, he purchased part of um, um, the Roman Road at Holtai, which was part of the London to so-called Lewis Roman Road. We now know it as the London to 
um, Bridge Farm or, 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 or Barker Mills Roman Road. It doesn't actually seem to um, continue to Lewis, but he bought part of this. And um, uh, as we will see in the, the other slides, he excavated it and exposed it for public viewing. 1943, um, he helped the National Trust to buy Avery and Windmill Hill. And, you know, they are two major national sites. Um, okay, prehistoric, not Roman, but uh, um, very important. He never seems to get the credit. Um, he never looked for publicity um, when, when he made these generous um, uh, donations. 1948, um, a really um, key date, he published Roman Ways in the Weald. Um, he had been looking at Roman roads in um, Sussex and uh, Kent and Surrey, really from about 1927. He actually discovered one on his estate and um, uh, apparently went to the um, Sussex Archaeological Society to get it published and they said but there's no evidence that it's Roman and of course um, as many of you will know digging Roman roads you very rarely um, find Roman finds um, digging a, 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 a section of road but he persevered with his studies and um, the outcome was this book Roman Ways in the Weald and then in 1955 and then again in 1957, in two parts, he actually published Roman Roads of Britain, uh, a major undertaking, and still really the, um, uh, the Bible of Roman Roads uh, that we have today. 1960, um, Antiquity, the journal, um, was uh, uh, in a very bad financial situation, um, and together with... Um, a professor Richard Atkinson, he purchased antiquity and saved it from going out of business. 1964, he went back to his old college in Oxford and um, paid for the restoration of a quadrangle in the college. And if you go there today, you'll see that it is actually known as the Marguerite Quadrangle. Um, so a substantial building work, um, interested not just in archaeology, but in education and um, those type of cultural pursuits. 1961, um, another really important acquisition by him. He bought the land at Fishbourne in 1961 with the uh, discovery of the palace at Fishbourne. It would have been destroyed. The state was not going to step in and um, protect the site and save it for the nation. It was he that stepped in, bought the land, which was about to be de re um, developed for housing. Um, he then paid for the excavations and the cover buildings that uh, later went over the palace. And so probably one of our finest Roman sites um, in, in Britain today, saved um, um, by, by, by this man. And then in 1976, um, he died in, in February. So that is really a, 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 a quick rundown of his, um, his, his personal history. So in this picture, um, we see the Margaret family home, this Charlton Park, um, which they, they, they occupied until 1940. Um, it is today a, um, a golf course and um, the modern building that replaces what was there. Um, so not really um, much more to, to, to say about that. What we have um, of Margaret's um, uh, wartime experiences include um, his unpublished war diaries, one of my... Um, Thoughts is that one day to, to, to perhaps revisit these diaries and, um, and, and get them published. Um, but he wrote these diaries then between 1916 and 1919, deposited at the Sussex Archaeological Society headquarters in Lewis, um, handwritten um, and uh, also typed uh, notes. But um, we have them 
uh, describing his experiences um, in France. And what we can see here on this page is a, a growing interest in aerial photography. Um, as part of his military work, he was involved with aerial photographs. And you can see in his, um, in his diaries here that he was looking at photographs, beginning to interpret them, make notes about them, sketching the things that he could see, all of the things that come out really from about 1927 when he um, picks up this um, strong interest in, in Roman roads and uh, other archaeology. 1932, um, he's married to Dorothy Jolly, another very wealthy individual, so she had um, good money behind her. And um, what we see here is this Guard of Honour from the Lingfield Fire Brigade. Um, one should point out that it's um, Ivan Margrie or Donald Margrie who actually paid for um, the fire brigade at this stage. And so they were um, returning, a, um, returning the favour. But his um, main home for certainly his married life was um, U Lodge at Felbridge, and this is the, the house today. Um, and um, I was very pleased to discover that you can actually visit this, or you could pre um, the um, um, COVID, because uh, on every Sunday, the last Sunday of every month, um, it is... Um, um, there's a restaurant and conference centre here, but they open it up for Sunday lunches. So if anyone ever wants to visit um, um, Ivan Margaret's home, assuming they return to this after the um, pandemic, um, you, you've got an opportunity to go in the house itself. And I've got a, a number of photographs to show you. So this is the gentleman with the white shirt, is the um, current owner. Um, doesn't seem to have a particular interest in Margaret. I did offer to provide a, a photograph of him and some information. Um, after Margaret died in, in 1976 and his wife died in 1978, um, the house was taken over by Rent-A-Kill, of all people, and turned into one of their training and conference centres. And he then, uh, this gentleman, bought it um, and turned it into um, a restaurant and conference centre. But it gives you a chance to look inside um, his home. None of the rooms, unfortunately, are um, um, as they would have been in, in Margaret's day. I was always hoping to find um, a library. Um, one imagines he would have had a really fantastic uh, uh, library room. So if you go there today, um, there are these... Uh, um, um, dining areas um, with very elaborate Chinese um, wall decorations here. And again, a lot of dark wood um, in, the, in this period and lighter wood in other areas. And he's right in the middle of the forest, so in a, in a really um, lovely um, setting. So on to um, his work with Roman roads, and um, the, that is what he's uh, um, um, known for and what we're particularly interested in, I suppose, with uh, this, um, this research group. Now, the methods that um, Marguerite had, he didn't have all of the geophysics that we have today. In fact, they didn't have any of the geophysical equipment that we can use for tracing roads or LIDAR or any of those things. Um, so this is a list of his principal methods of tra tracking down um, Roman roads, documents and archaeological literature, place names and names of roads, so things like Stane Street in Sussex, um, traditions that things may be Roman roads, ancient sites and finds, um, maps, he was um, obsessed with looking at maps and particularly aerial photographs. So his work in the military had prepared him for identifying landscape features. 
and then field work. So he would do all of the above researches and then actually go out and with a spade, usually um, testing, uh, ground truthing uh, the lines of the roads that he um, had identified. And we can see here again from the Sussex Archaeological Society Library collection, um, some of his um, own um, annotations of aerial photographs. So here a causeway um, that he had identified um, as part of a Roman road from Furl to Glind. So in 1939, then, he um, bought this um, section of Roman Road at um, a place called Hol Holtai, um, which isn't far away from um, East Grinstead, on the East Grinstead to um, Tunbridge Wells Road, just off that. And this, um, he, he stripped um, quite a large section of the road, as you can see. It had um, a slag metal surface, and the, um, I first saw this in 1983, and the um, surface is sort of almost concreted into a solid mass, but um, it survived reasonably well with possible ruts, as you can see, um, on the surface. So we, we can see various things um, on here, and again, um, another shot of the same thing. And he had this area fenced off. There was enough land that he bought between there and the public road so that the, there was access to the site, a footpath. And uh, his method of maintaining this during the period of his life was um, he was in the unenviable um, situation to be able to send his gardeners um, so, you know, the, the people that maintained his um, house um, or garden were, were, were sent up to, to weed this and keep it in um, a good state. The top left-hand photograph is um, a photograph I took in uh, 1983 when um, I first saw it, and you can see the metal surface um, still um, cleaned at that stage. Someone went up every year and made, made sure it was weeded. You can't see any flanking ditches. Um, those um, areas are covered by the, the vegetation. And then uh, on the right-hand side, you've got a photograph of the site, still fairly well maintained in 2010. And the fence, the original fence still um, in use, uh, as it is still today. And then um, August 2017, when um, um, Mike and uh, I visited the, the site, you can see that uh, vegetation is uh, um, now um, a, a current problem there. And the tree growth, if you noticed from the original photographs, trees have grown up on the spoil heaps and banks of soil on either side of the um, road that he had purchased. Moving on to um, um, other aspects of his work at um, Fishbourne Roman Palace, they have his toolbox and um, uh, so a trowel and uh, a rather interesting um, hand brush, not quite the sort we um, tend to use today. And if you open the box, various um, uh, items in there for recording and surveying. And uh, what I particularly liked was this Dollywog stationary box, probably something today that uh, um, is politically incorrect, but um, there you are, it's uh, in the box. And it was just a, a reused box that he used for his six inch nails. Now, the way that he approached roads was to use strip maps. So given that they are long linear things, roads are particularly difficult to um, record in terms of um, illustrations. And so he used these strip maps and um, they feature 
in his various articles and books. And here is an example where he's cut a section um, through the road. I actually live in Ditchling, so this is just down the road from, from me. And he cut a section, and we can see um, he's drawn the section. The black is the um, stone or flint metalling, in this case, flint metalling um, of the, the road surface as he identified it. So, for, again, for his time, good sections, um, well recorded in terms of location. And he used um, um, a system of numbers to identify the roads. And I know that that is something that is um, still causing problems as new roads are uh, discovered and the um, numbering system needs to be, uh, needs to accommodate them. But we can see here his system, the primary roads um, or the, the, the key roads were given primary numbers. So one here is Watling Street. And um, because it was so long, it was actually divided into 1A, going from Dover to Canterbury, then from Canterbury um, towards Rochester is 1B, then 1C and 1D. You can see Watling Street here continuing northwards. So his system was to use, so that, that gives him only nine primary roads. Then um, branch roads coming off that um, were given double figures. So we can see 13, 14, 15 um, as um, some of the, the branch ones in the southeast. And then at a, a further stage, you've got uh, um, various roads which um, have um, uh, here 100 and, uh, um, 160 sort of branches off, off branches. And um, the numbering system 150 here for the London to, to Hassett's Road. Now, he recorded um, individual roads in terms of reports in the Sussex Archaeological Society collections, Surrey collections, and so on. And then in 1948, we've got this publication, Roman Ways in the Weald, which is um, still a, a favourite with people in the southeast in terms of looking up about roads and the work that he did on them, so it's particularly detailed. And then his larger survey of roads in Britain generally, so two volumes um, and later published in one, one volume. So 1967 and 1973, um, both those volumes being combined in, in one. And he does explain um, usefully using drawings um, his um, technical terms that are, are used in these in these books. Now we should mention Codrington. You know, it's not Margaret was the first person set out to um, map the, the the roads of, of Roman Britain. Um, Codrington in 1903 had um, produced a map. Um, Margaret obviously added considerably to that, and the Ordnance Survey. For many years, did additional um, recording and identifying um, on many on many of their maps, uh, larger scale maps, um, the, the lines of Roman roads. So that is really the numbering system that we've we've already talked about. Margaret also produced um, many other papers. Um, he was interested not just in Roman roads, but in enclosures and um, even um, post-medieval um, road tolls and uh, toll houses and gates and things like that. So, um, but uh, Roman was his main uh, passion, and in Sussex he produced this overall booklet on Roman Sussex. One of the things that he identified in Sussex that has been fairly contentious is an area of so-called Roman centuriation at Ripe um, in East Sussex, 
and at the top you can see an area of um, um, Roman centuriation at Padua in, in Italy and then underneath it um, a similar looking system of roads and fields which um, Margri using measurements thought were similar to that uh, Italian centuriation. The um, jury is still out on this one. There's no, um, I think most people today discount this as an example of Roman centuriation. It's not particularly in an area where you might expect to get centuriation. There are Roman sites there in that area. Um, there are Roman villas and uh, other buildings, and there are genuine Roman roads. So I wouldn't like to say it wasn't, but it's uh, um, generally thought not to be centuriation. <clears throat> when uh, Marguerite first went on the Council of the Sussex Archaeological Society and also Surrey, um, he would have been um, meeting well-known um, archaeologist. It must have been quite an intimidating um, introduction. So fellow members, people like the Kerwins in Sussex, uh, Saltzman, a major historian, but also archaeologist, Shepherd Freer. Um, interesting to see him with his, his, his pipe, apparently. In, most, in many photographs, he's, he's got a pipe, a pipe in his mouth. And George Holloman, so there was, there's a mixture of academics and um, local amateur archaeologists that would have been on the council at that time. And um, S.E. Wimbolt, who um, um, wrote a book uh, with a spade on Stane Street, um, he uh, was on the council at the same time and may have, um, may have felt that Margaret was beginning to step on his toes a bit, I suppose. He would have, Margaret would have been, I think, rather surprised by um, the trusteeship of the Sussex Archaeological Society um, in 2014, particularly the large number of women. Uh, there were women on the council in um, earlier times, but um, fa fairly rarely. Um, and it would have been interesting to see how he would have um, fitted in um, alongside us. The properties as uh, chairman of the Sussex Archaeological Society, he was responsible for Lewis Castle, um, Anne of Cleves House in, in Lewis, Marlepins, uh, a Norman masonry building in Shoreham, Mickleham Priory, the Priest House at West Hoathley, Wilmington Priory, the Long Man of uh, Wilmington, and um, finally, um, adding himself um, to that portfolio, Fishbourne Roman Palace. So these are all properties that um, the Sussex Archaeological Society still own today and um, will hopefully be opening some of them on, on Monday. But it's Fishbourne that we um, need to particularly thank Margaret for his um, work. Um, he did spend money on some of the others, certainly Anne of Cleves in Lewis. He paid for an annex stroke store at the rear of the property. But at Fishbourne, he bought the land, he, he, he bought the cover buildings, um, virtually everything that we, we, we appreciate today. And so uh, one of our finest properties, it's hard to imagine that this could have been destroyed if it wasn't for Marguerite buying the land. And it does make you wonder um, today, you know, what would happen if another fishbourne came up on a development site? And um, just to emphasise the importance of that, that complex. Mosaics, probably the finest um, first and second century mosaics that we have in, in Britain the floor heating systems etc and of course that work the excavation work there was done by a young professor barry cunliffe and um marguerite was the um paid the bills but um 
um, they, they were very lucky to have uh, such a, a good archaeologist as Cunliffe to excavate the site and interpret it. And in his uh, older life, um, Ivan Margrie was one of, one of the great things that he liked to do was to take visitors round Fishbourne. Um, he almost, uh, he never had any children um, and it's almost as though it was his baby and in many ways it, it was. He'd, um, he'd bought it, nurtured it, um, everything. And here he is taking the King of Sweden uh, on a tour round the palace. The other sites I mentioned earlier that he'd saved for the nation, Windmill Hill, um, wasn't entirely his money, but uh, he put, put up a substantial amount of it. Avery, you can't imagine this not now being in the ownership of um, the National Trust or the state, but again, um, it was up for sale and he um, came up with um, quite a substantial amount of the money for it. Exeter College. So the Margaret Quadrangle is here, it's this, this area in here, and these buildings had to be um, restored or um, upgraded. On his death, um, he left substantial amounts of money to various organisations, the Sussex Archaeological Society, which was his um, main local passion, um, but Surrey and Kent both also got uh, uh, quite large amounts of money. Um, the Royal Archaeological Institute, um, Society of Antiquaries, and not forgetting his other interests, the Royal Geographical Society. All of them got bequests in his, um, in his will. But he also remembered um, local people and his staff he was careful to make sure that his staff um, had um, money lasting into retirement, goodwill bequests. The Margaret's financed, as I said earlier, the Lingfield Fire Brigade. Hard to imagine people today, individuals um, being so generous, donated the field used by the Felbridge Cricket Club. Um, St John's Ambulance Brigade Hall in Felbridge was given by the family. He was a benefactor to his local church, the St John's Church at Felbridge, and we've mentioned the land at um, the National Trust. And so coming to um, the end of uh, the, the, this talk, um, the top right, he is receiving a cup here, not for any archaeological um, deed, this was actually for having a prize um, bull at um, a county fair. And uh, we must remember that he was um, a gentleman. He was um, a farmer. He had uh, a big estate with uh, um, farming um, aspects to it. He was also good at finances, and managed his own money, money well. Um, but here he is then receiving um, this, this award. And on the bottom left, we can see him addressing groups of a group of people um, on an archaeological site. Sadly, I don't know um, where it may have been at um, um, Holt I, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. And as the caption says, one of the incredible things is that given his generosity, he turned down an OBE. Um, he, he didn't want to be. Um, Photographed. I found it very, very difficult to um, find photographs of him. And if any of the any of you uh, listening have photographs, please, please send them to me if you if you have any. Um, he wasn't someone that was photographed very often, and he didn't want that publicity. Feeling, you know, he had a feeling that he had this money, and that he um, um, had done nothing to justify it. So. You know, he, he was glad to use it for good causes. And the final words then, um, by the Surrey Archaeological Society obituary, Mar Marguerite was a larger-than-life person, physically an imposing figure, 
exceptional in intellect and ability, and of conspicuous dignity, goodness and integrity. He was a patient, humble and courteous. He was generous not only of his time, but of his wealth. He saw needs and met them unobtrusively. And that, I think, is, you know, uh, a remarkable um, statement uh, about uh, um, a generous man. And as I said at the beginning, it's a shame that we don't have uh, more like him in, in today's society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. If I could just ask you to, uh, I was going to ask you to stop sh sharing the screen, but you appear to have already done so. Um, again, thank you very much for a firm, uh, an excellent and fascinating talk. Um, and I'm sure everybody who's attended tonight has learned a lot that they didn't know and didn't expect to know um, about Ivan Margery. Um, we have had one or two questions. Uh, my fault, I'm afraid. I forgot to mention to everyone that if you want to ask a question, please do so through the chat. That was my mistake at the beginning, uh, but you can ask them now and I will pass them on to David. Um, just one question to start. Do you think that he is celebrated enough given what he actually achieved? With his life and if not what what do you think we we could potentially do to make sure he is remembered i think in some ways um he is you know the fact that at exeter college in in oxford you know there is a a, a margery uh, quadrangle but and there probably is a, a small plaque saying something about him um and at fishbourne there is uh, uh, again um an inscription that says you know about his his deeds of buying the site but um in in, in a way it's um because he didn't seek publicity during his lifetime i think you know the really sad ones are avery and, and maybe windmill hill that you know avery particularly i've forgotten who the individual is that normally gets the credit for buying avery and saving it for the nation but you know Margery was there as well, and um, I did point out to them, uh, the National Trust, when I last went to Avery, that I thought there ought to be a plug for him there. Um, but I think, you know, in in our work, we need to um, always recognise the contribution that he he has made, and you know, if there are um, opportunities to. Um, set up things like research funds you know calling them the margary research fund is a way of maintaining his 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 name and um, contribution to activities but you may have other ideas <laughs> <laughs> i think you already know one of them yeah um yeah the the issue of, of whole tie has come up quite a bit actually in the the chat during the, the talk and the condition that it's in um a few people have actually uh, suggested some ideas for working on the site and getting it back to something like it should be. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time going into this, um, but as, as David's well aware, um, we have tried to get involved in the, the, the maintenance of Altai in the past, about four years ago, uh, and I'm actually making some moves in that direction. But everybody who's expressed an interest in getting involved i will contact at some point tomorrow right I'm going can, to I just say on, can i just say on uh, about that mike that um there is a new chief executive that just started at the sussex archaeological society and um hopefully when when, when he's got his feet under the the, the table that uh, um you know that will be something he will run with and I'm sure that they will wel welcome help to to, to to get the site in a, in, a, in a better state. We, we have to hope so. Um, I'm going to move on because I, I, I could descend into a rant quite <laughs> quite easily. No, I can I'm understand. Not so not tonight. Um, right. The most important question came first from David Breer, who wants to see your dog again. <laughs> Moving swiftly on. <laughs> 
I don't think he ever saw him, did he? he just I didn't heard him. know. No. <laughs> um, right. I'm going to flick through what we've got. Quite a few questions about um, centuriation, which you you raised, um, and the observations that Marguerite had actually made. Um, a couple from Andy Graham and others, um, Jim Grady as well. Could you just give us an overview of the likelihood of centuriation actually existing in the, the, the southeast of England? Because it, it is up for debate, isn't it? Well, it's, a, it's up for debate in terms of Britain generally, I think. Uh, they, there, there was a book a couple of years ago um, published on Roman agriculture in Britain, and, and there's a statement in there that there is no con um, convincing examples of Roman centuriation in, 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 in Britain. Um, I would suspect that if you were looking for it, you know, one would imagine that places like Colchester, you know, if you've got colonies of um, retired soldiers, those are the areas you might expect to find centuriation. Um, they're, they're likely looking places where they've all been built over and destroyed, who knows. Um, I think also um, places like the Fens, if you're reclaiming land, maybe there are examples in those locations. But Ripe is, is, is not really... Now, in Sussex, we don't have a, a military presence for um, most of the, the, the Roman period. It's only at the end with Pevensey, um, Saxon, and Shawfort. There isn't really a, a military presence uh, uh, at all. So where is this centuriation coming from? Um, Margaret was simply measuring the fields. It's a, a really flat area of land. And if you lay out fields on a flat area of land, you're probably going to end up with fairly regular, um, or you could end up with fairly regular um, rectangular fields. And in, in contrast, if you've got sloping ground, you know, that regularity may not may, may not survive. Um, but there are genuine Roman roads that run through it. There are Roman um, buildings on, on that area. Um, it's an area that really does need more research. But um, it was one that, you know, I think Margaret, you know, it struck him because of the regularity of the, um, the distances and was obviously one that he knew because, you know, he was working in that area himself. But I'd be interested to know if others have found similar examples elsewhere. Um, somebody has suggested, Chris and Susan, Susan McGrath suggested the area between the A2 and the Thames Medway near Rochester. Not an area I know. No. Um, I can't say I've come across that before. Certainly John Peterson was convinced by various areas in the in East Anglia. Um, we could probably talk all night about centuriation, which is not why, we, why we're here. I'm going to move on, going back to Marguerite himself. A um, couple of questions about his military career. Um, David Breer, again, has asked, not about your dog this time, but to what extent do you feel his army background helped with his field work? Well, I, I, as I said, I, th I think the use of aerial photographs, it must have been a sort of eye-opener to him that they had photographs for obviously observing um, the opposition and um, the fact that people were going up in planes and photographing areas. Um, and the fact that he took all of these notes, he was actually recording probably the, the archaeology in France at the time he was looking at you know, various trackways and um, ridges and, and things. Um, but also uh, um, just questioning what, what the landscape was was telling him. It, it's, it's something outside of his sort of chemistry stroke, uh, um, weather studies and, and, and getting him into looking at um, primary data, I think. It yeah. doesn't really answer it necessarily, but, uh, you know, no. it does seem that uh, you can see if you look at his diaries and then look at his later um, 
portfolio of working papers, um, a lot of similarities between the two. Andy Graham has asked if you wonder whether his wartime experience might have shaped his attitudes towards um, generosity and philanthropy. I think um, one of the things, of course, is that he never had any children. Um, and on, the, on his wife's death, I think um, the, the two of them gave away everything. You know, it was, it was quite a... Um, if you've got no kids to leave them to, it's... Uh, um, but he was just a, a genuinely... It sounds as though he's a genuinely generous man. A, another nice story... Um, comes from the Surrey Archaeological Society, where um, at council meetings each year they would review the budget, and um, it said that you know if there was uh, a shortfall, um, he just passed over a cheque. Now, um, now, how many organisations today um, <laughs> would you know? One doesn't know how, what sort of figures one's talking about there. One, they could be research, but. It just shows that sort of attitude that, you know, you just quietly pass the cheque across the table and problem solved. Well, I think he would, see one, it, <laughs> he would see it as a problem that needed solving and he had the solution in the bank. Yes. Yeah. Mark Siemens asked if his back wound in the First World War affected him very much in his later life. I don't know. I never personally met him. And it's one of my great regrets that I came into Sussex um, almost at the time that he um, that he that, that, that he died. So I, I and there are relatively few people now that really um, remember him um, well. But you know, he did have a I think a slight disability because of the the wound. Didn't seem to stop him doing his trenching and uh, um, trial trenching and so on. Um, but, yeah, you know, it, was, um, it must have been quite serious that he actually took him out of action for at least um, 1918. We have another question. <laughs> um, being a Southerner, how good was he in the North? And I'm quoting. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me, honestly. <laughs> I think it's recorded he had to wear three overcoats to go up north. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, when he was doing the work um, in the north, he would have been relying a lot on other people's work. The stuff in the southeast, a lot of it is his own primary um, research. And um, so the book, you know, The Roman Ways in the Weald, um, is probably the closest to his own personal portfolio. Um, he would have been relying on others for um, other parts of Britain. I am going to have to very quickly return to the subject of centuriation because <laughs> the chat room has gone mad. <laughs> I'm not really sure how many to put, to put out, but um, there's certainly a fascination with it. Um, the, the, the real issue is that most of the claimed sites for centuriation in this country, most of, don't really fit a regular grid in the same way as centuriation in Italy, for example. And this is the problem, that we don't have the distinct and clear evidence surviving in our modern field systems. Several people have pointed out, quite rightly, that um, land was um, allotted to veterans and there must have been some way of doing that but whether that was done on a, a regular system or not as far as i'm aware we have absolutely no knowledge in this country um, i'm pretty sure you would agree with that david yes um, and i would refer people to look at margaret's own report it's in the sussex archaeological collections for 1940 so, you know, if you look at that report, um, you know, see what he's saying, and um, um, that's, that, that's the basis of why he came up with that suggestion. It's the only one in Sussex. Um, it's the only one in the southeast that I'm aware of. 
I'm just flicking through the chat to try and find something that isn't about saturation, <laughs> and I'm failing miserably. Um, I think I might make a summary of these and put them out to, to people because they are quite fascinating, but we don't really have the time to, to discuss every one. If anybody has got any questions for David about Marguerite the man, if they can very quickly put them in the next few seconds, I'm not seeing anything else coming up. Um, so somebody has usefully put in a chat, Bob Pitt, um, that a hundred thousand pounds is worth about um, six million four hundred and forty-four thousand one hundred and seventy-one pounds. So thank you very much for that. Um, I shall note that. I don't, I don't know how you work that out, but uh, um, you know and. The money that uh, Marguerite left, certainly um, the money in Surrey, um, you know, is uh, accumulated to uh, um, a, a very substantial um, financial uh, holding. Mm. So, uh, you know, some two million, I think they've they've, they've got. And Eighty-eight pence. Okay, I think we're going to have to round it off at that. Um, could I just thank everybody for attending? Um, we've had a really good attendance tonight of 100 and 132. 132 people. But most of all, thank David for an excellent and entertaining evening. Um, this is just the first of a series which we'll be advertising more about. You saw at the beginning the next three lined up. Um, I will be putting something on the website in the next couple of days, so you'll be able to see the, the ones that are forthcoming for the rest of the year. And with that, um, all it remains for me to do is thank David again and say good night, everybody. Cheers. Um, Mike, just one last point. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I, go I on, just put it. I just put it in chat, but you, you were writing off at the time. You mentioned you were hinting about um, some sort of commemoration for Marguerite, and then you didn't go any further on that. What, what was behind no, that? No, I was, I was trying to prompt um, uh, David to mention his diaries. Oh, <laughs> right. yes. um, can I leave, leave that to you, David? <laughs> yes, it's, you know, something that it, it was a great shame that a few years ago it was suggested that um, in nine, for, for 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, that they would put in Margaret's relevant diary in the Sussex Archaeological Collections, and it wasn't felt appropriate. But I, I would have thought it would have been quite nice to have had someone's diary per year, um, you know, given the Sussex connection there. But they they have got a lot more information. I haven't as yet had the time really to think about um, doing anything with them. But they are in the library if anyone ever wants to go and consult them. I would personally like to see a, a much larger and better um, commemoration at Fishbourne. Um, the Roman Palace, as David pointed out, wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Ivan Marguerite. And yes, there is a small plaque on the wall and a very small display, not very, not very well done, in my opinion, and rather tucked away around a corner. Um, I think he merits a little bit more than that, personally. Yeah. As a member of, of the um, Friends of the, of the Committee of the Friends of uh, Fishbourne Roman Palace, perhaps I can bring that up at our next um meeting our vision virtual meeting we might even have a real one soon so yeah i, I will i will bring thank you that very much forward. richard i don't think, I, think any, I don't think there's anyone else here from the that society nice to see you richard yeah okay <laughs> yeah i i shall certainly bring that up and see what we can do yeah okay i'm just looking to see if anything else has come up while we've been talking lots of thanks, lots of thanks. um one of the things that we, we discussed, Mike and I discussed on site at Fishbourne, was possibly a bit more on Roman roads 
um, there would have been a road from the mm. palace to Chichester itself. And we wandered around the grounds looking at the possibility of some sort of explanation as to Roman roads generally, wasn't it? That's what yes. we were looking at. Mm. Um, yes, and it's a shame we didn't actually take that any further for um, various reasons at the time, mm. but it's something we'll possibly revisit with uh, a new chef, chief executive. Who knows? Yeah. Okay. Um, for the second time, then, <laughs> I will call this evening to a close. And there's still a lot of people who are logged on. So thank you all for attending. And hopefully we'll see most of you again later on in the year. Thank you again and good night.